But I'd like to introduce now Gail Moss Solomon, who is an attorney at law with an extensive experience in the legal field. Uh, prior to joining Grace Kennedy, Ms. Moss Solomon was the legal and regulatory director and the company secretary for Digicel Jamaica, with responsibility for the Turks and Caicos and Cayman Islands, and formed part of Digicel Jamaica Limited's executive management team. She was also a partner at the firm Harrison & Harrison and held senior positions in the Attorney General's chambers. We now welcome Gail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. I'm so excited that we have that conversation. So, um, obviously... Thank you, Nicole and Kevin, for that lovely intro. <laughs> Obviously, you've done some pre-reading, and I was quite impressed to see that you have all the sustainable development goals captured um, in the report <laughs> that you've shared. So I'm really excited to start that conversation with you. Um, let me start by asking, how did this kind of come along? How did you deal with this multitude of objectives, imperfect object objectives that are out there? Um, we're, we're, still, <laughs> we're still on the journey, Nicole. It's very much... Um, a labor of love for GK, um, but but you know it's been somewhat organic um, because you know this is a very I don't know if you know but this is a very special year for Grace Kennedy. We're celebrating a hundred years. I don't know if you can see my pin there. Um, so we were founded. <laughs> we were founded in 1922, and mm -hmm. we like to say um, on February 14th. So we would like to say that we were a company that was born in love and we continue with that we care ethos. So um, so it's really embedded in our DNA in that we, we care about the communities we serve. We care about our employees in a very significant way. And we care about providing good services, financial services and food. That's really, you know, what we do. We, we are... We are headquartered in Jamaica still, but we're really a multinational organization with operations in over 30 countries worldwide. Um, mm -hmm. We distribute food um, across the world, but we have manufacturing and distribution in Canada, UK, USA, and across Europe and across the Caribbean. And then financial services we provide in Jamaica and across the Caribbean. So we're proud of that. But um, I think this ESG journey was a sort of natural progression from our robust CSR framework. So we have two foundations um, who do a lot of great work in the areas of the environment, health, um, community development, and, um, and even our business entities. It's not just the foundation's work. Um, our employees are heavily involved and our businesses in, in kind of carrying out this we care ethos that we're very proud of. So, so it was a natural progression for us. And your presentation was, um, was really eye-opening and inspiring because it shows that we're on the right track, but that we still have a lot of work to do. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. It's a journey. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's exactly the spirit to take that, I would say. And if I look at your sectors, um, food, financial services, you mentioned also health concerns. This, these are like right in the center of a lot of the major ESG discussions that are going on, right? How did you, how did you get your arms around it? Maybe in terms of very practical recommendations for somebody who wants to start the journey, but might be overwhelmed by the expected complexity. Right. So, um, so for us, um, because of the diversity of our business, it, it would make it more challenging. So yes. even our alignment with the UN SDGs, for example, um, had to be quite diverse because we wanted to ensure that there was something relatable for all of our um, business units. You know, we have a supermarket chain in Jamaica, for example, Hilo. Um, you know, we have our manufacturing division. We also have insurance. We have a bank. We have um, Western Union. We're exclusive partners for Western Union in the, in the Caribbean region. So, um, so we are so diverse. And mm -hmm. so we had to start. And, and I think um, I like to say a lot of it was organic. We had to start with what was important to our key stakeholders, our employees, 
um, who are a representative of our wider stakeholder group, or our consumers, our customers. Um, and so that is really the approach that we took mm -hmm. to look at what was important to our employees and build on those on those values. So, for example, last year we codified our energy policy group wide, which was already in practice, um, and we're very policy driven. It was mm -hmm. already in practice, but we took the opportunity to codify it so that. Um, all our stakeholders across the group could look at um, best practices for manufacturing, for any new um, new plant builds, um, anything that needs to be done that has an energy component to ensure that we're utilizing best practices and, and staying true to our commitment for a better world, essentially. Excellent. Sounds great. And I love your point around policies as well that's always if you look at requirements it's always something that comes up right how do you make it tangible not yes. leave it with a commitment but make it really tangible yes at the same time when you move into something that's tangible that's where the discussion starts right why do we want to do this isn't that painful what do we have out of that isn't how it, is it expensive <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly that's right <laughs> How was that for you? How was your time when you were developing this? <laughs> yes, so so we're still developing, and mm -hmm. um, and I have to, you know, this year we were very proud. So so I'll tell you a story on on how this um, how we came to produce our first report, our first ESG report this year, our impact report, um, which we published with our annual report this year, and okay. I really have to um, thank. The PwC team, Carolyn Bell and Janice Narona, who's who is on now, um, who really gave us a great deal of support in producing uh, that report. But how this came about was our group CEO, which you know, it, this any initiative really starts with leadership, and our group CEO, who is a senator in Jamaica, was uh, making comments in the Senate with respect to some changes to our legislation, the Companies Act. And he, in his research, um, raised the point in the Senate, many things in relation to the regulations governing companies, um, but he's a bit of a pioneer. He, he was instrumental in the um, formation of the Junior Stock Exchange many years ago. Um, so when he was doing his research around the regulations governing companies in Jamaica and the region, he um, brought to the fore the fact that more regional companies should be reporting on their ESG framework. And that, of all the comments that he made around the regulations, that was what got the most traction. That is what persons <laughs> on social media, in the press, really latched on to. So, it. of course, he came back from that presentation last year, early last year, and said, Gail and team, um, we're going to lead from the front. We are going to produce an <laughs> ESG report this year <laughs> on, on what we have been doing and what our commitment is. Um, and so that that is how we ended up. Um, and, and it makes sense for us because we have we have a mantra in GK that what gets measured gets done. So mm -hmm. we are proud of our environmental commitments, our commitments to community, our robust governance framework. Um, but we recognize that it was important for us to share this with the public, share it with all of you, so that you can hold us accountable and so that we could develop metrics um, that could be tracked across the organization that all our employees could buy in and feel a part of this process. And then we continue to report on it annually. So that, that's the genesis. You now know um, exactly how we started um and and we have big plans for the future so and i think it's really inspiring and it underlines two major elements right the one well maybe three the one is it has to be top led the other one is it requires some courage to start out <laughs> and it's really a leap of faith from the start and there will be a lot of the discussions around we don't have the data it's not there right. yet etc right. so right. and that is getting us to three the controlling measurement point that you mentioned it's great that you took the, the leap of faith and the courage mm -hmm. to just say we'll move ahead and there will be something and now we can take it and work with it and digest and develop that's really great 
we often get this question around what does it cost? What is our benefit, right? Linking a bit to this entire double materiality analysis, which is more vague for people than everything else. Did you have that conversation? What's Where's your mind on that or your experience on that? So, so yes, we are certainly having the conversation. So, so we talked a little bit about where we are on the journey and that for us, it has been a bit organic and, and essentially coming from within. So it's about us um, tracking what we're we're already doing, which is what we were able to to, to report on um, for 2021. Um, and 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 we're proud of, of those achievements. You know, we're we're proud of our diversity. We're proud of um, you know we have over 60 percent of our management team is female. Um, one third of our board of directors is female. The, the core executive um, committee, which comprises of um, Dan Webby, our CEO, Andrew Massad, our CFO, and um, the the heads of our our divisions. So we have our foods division, we have Frank James, and we have Andrea Coy. We also have Grace Burnett and Stephen Whittingham. We have our chief human resources officer. So my point is that half of the core executive and myself as a general counsel, mm -hmm. half of the core executive team is actually female. You know, we're, we're proud of those sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't so difficult for us to pull together. You know, last year we spent nearly 200 million Jamaican dollars in, in community development across mm -hmm. the group. Um, so we're proud of that work and we were able to report on that. But uh, Nicole, you're absolutely right. It's, it goes further than that. And um, oh, I see a question coming in. Um, it goes further than that. And we have to expand to... Um, these bigger questions, such as what are our partners doing? Um, are we ensuring that our partners are using these sustainable practices that we are committed to? Um, are they providing a safe working environment for their employees in the same way that we are committed to? And we are, we are very much on that journey with our partners. Um, in terms of Yes, we are doing work to mitigate our impact on the environment. And, and now we have to uh, broaden that discussion, which is, which is what you touched on in your presentation. Um, and I need some of those graphs to present to my team. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've had for over a decade a very robust enterprise risk management framework. Um, that reports into the board of directors um, and the executive committee that, that I mentioned, um, led by Judith Chung and Jaron Thomas in the, in the corporate office with, with team members across the group. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that we are, of course, looking at is climate change and the impact on our business. It is, it's a significant risk. You know, we, we are... We are food people, <laughs> so, you know, it has a very practical impact on our supply chain. We are, in fact, in farming ourselves. Um, we also have a financial services division that is largely comprised of general insurance. So yeah. we are doing a great deal of modeling um, and, and assessing the, the, the environment in that regard. So, so to answer your question, it's a journey. We are on that journey. Um, and yes, there are many significant challenges, but I think the important thing is for us to codify, so mm -hmm. to publish, to develop the metrics, to track them, and then, of course, keep publishing them so that our, our, our stakeholders can hold us accountable and, and really watch our progress. Um, you know, the, the, the ESG framework, we, we, we last year started looking at our 2030 vision, you know, mm -hmm. what do we want to be um, in the next 10 years, less than 10 years? Um, and, and the ESG framework is, 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 is a huge part of that. And, and we see, yes, um, that there are risks and yes, there are challenges, but we also see opportunities. Yeah. Lovely. And thank you for picking up another of these kind of key points that we often see while you might decide to start with reporting, it will move into strategy. There's no way yes. not to do that, right? And ideally they are intertwined from the start. So very, very good point. Um, 
let me just pick up on one last thing because often in our client conversations, when they've taken the leap of faith, they have started modeling, they are coming out with some type of reporting, but internally they always have a lot more. Another key concern is now we're going out to the market and maybe some of our customers might not react nicely or a supply chain might not react nicely. We don't want to bother them in asking them nasty questions. What's your stance on that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge and there is always that, um, that sort of tussle and tension mm-hmm. um, between having, having this vision and strategy um, and then the implementation is challenging. Um, but, but we have that in all areas of the business, mm-hmm. right? So I go back to our risk management framework, which, which really, um, and, our, and our risk appetite, which, which really governs the way that we do business. And so um, in all things, we look at the risk versus the reward. Um, we look at whether we can implement any mitigating strategies. So if we do have a supplier who is our best and preferred supplier, but unfortunately they are not aligned, then then a part of our approach has to be understanding the alternatives that are out there. And maybe it will not be an immediate switch, uh, which, you know, again, our stakeholders hold us accountable. It may not be an immediate switch, but we certainly will have as part of our 2030 vision to get to where we need to get to, um, we will have that in 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 train for for changing to another supplier, for example. So there are challenges, and um, there is always the tension between the ensuring profitability while while putting all of these sort of strategies in place. But but you're right, Nicole. It's about ensuring that the discussion is happening at the right level. Yeah, and that it really forms part of our strategy, and that the leadership and the entire organization buys into that bigger picture. Absolutely, yeah, and it's also this switch of the discussion, right? Um, previously, the debate was why do I need to do it, and now the question comes up of what happens if I don't do it. So, Great. what does it mean to me? And often, the losses are much higher than Absolutely. what you can gain when you proactively move. Lovely. Thank you for raising that there is a question in the chat. For some reason, I can't Mm -hmm. see it. Um, Kevin, may I ask you to jump in with a bit of the moderation on the questions from the panel, so from the audience, so that we can um, pick those up as well as I don't see them. Uh, Yes, there's there's, uh, a question to to please explain carbon credits and how local businesses can access the credits. So so there was a previous question, Kevin, around governance and uh, um, to do with our previous uh, CEO and Chairman Douglas Arrain, um, even before that carbon credits question. Are you seeing that one? Do you want to pick that up directly? Yes. So, so it, it, the question says for Gail, GK has always led in this space, um, starting with Mr. Arrain as chair and CEO decades ago, um, well, a decade ago, um, when no other companies were interested in governance, how much has the GK board supported the, the ESG genesis of the group? So. So that's a great question, and um, it really ties into our governance framework for for ESG for Grace Kennedy. Um, so yes, we 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 are quite proud um, to be um, real leaders in the corporate governance space. I mean, um, it's something that we take very seriously, and. We had our Grace Kennedy 100th anniversary lecture uh, last week at In Fact, Douglas Orient spoke. And one of the things he mentioned was that when we were looking to expand internationally, we recognized that um, our partners wanted to partner with a company that they could trust. So, you know, our principles of honesty, integrity and trust were very important, but we needed to show more than that. And so our governance framework was was very critical. And so we did a lot of work in shoring up our governance framework. So when we embarked on the ESG journey, we took a similar approach. We we adopted the International Sustainability Standards Board 
uh, framework for governance for ESG. So I am the lead and I report to the executive committee and the corporate governance and nomination committee of the board. To answer your question, the, the Grace Kennedy board, um, we really have an excellent board of directors. Um, they have been fully bought in on this, on this journey. Um, and they have always um, managed that very good balance between, of course, um, ensuring that there is um, a sustainable and profitable business with also ensuring that we focus on, on, on these other areas that really do matter, such as this robust ESG framework. Um, so I think because of the type of company that we are and the robust governance framework that we have had in place for decades, I think that um, it made this ESG journey that much easier in terms of buying from the very top and being able to implement. So thanks for that question. The other one about carbon credits. Is that question for me? There's a question about carbon credits and yes, we, we actually can defer that one because that's going to come into play a bit more in, in, in the segment right after you. So we'll we'll stick a pin in that one and, okay. and definitely address it. Okay. Are there other questions that we want to pick up at this point? I'm not seeing I'm not seeing any others, Nicole. Lovely. Um, let me reflect on the governance point, maybe briefly. Um, you might see kind of one scandal after the other hitting the newspapers around greenwashing. <laughs> and I was just in a preparation for a panel of financial service providers um, who are coming out of Germany. So the nerve, like the level of nervousness, you can feel it in the room. Um, and this discussion around, we're still missing some of the standards to really know what yes. we can say and what we can't. Yes. How do you perceive this? You know, that, that is a great question. And um, that is one of the, the significant challenges. Um, it's just the lack of guidance, the lack of um, benchmarking, particularly for a Grace Kennedy in, 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 the, in the range of businesses that mm -hmm. we're in and, and based in the Caribbean region. You know, there's there's not a great deal of comparative analysis that we can rely on and say, well, here are a few companies that are advanced in this journey, and so we can sort of learn from them. And 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 of course, it is it is hugely daunting when you see what's happening in the press as you try to embark on something that is hugely positive, um, but then results in such negative backlash. Um, so, you know, one of our and it, it's, it's even more relevant to us at, at Grace Kennedy because one, a part of our 2030 vision, apart from, you know, um, tripling or, or profitability, um, is, is, is to list on an international stock exchange. So, oh, so, yes. our, <laughs> so, so, so currently we're listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange and, and on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange. And part of our 2030 vision is to be listed on an international stock exchange. So we need to get our ducks in a row in terms of exactly what our reporting framework looks like, what exactly we're tracking and what we are publishing um, to ensure that we are in line with those international reporting, um, the SASBs, um, yes. the IFRS standards um, across the world. So it is daunting, but, but you know... Um, Again, I have to really congratulate PwC um, for leading in this space because we are confident that we will find the right partners. Um, we might not have all the expertise internally because it's a developing area, um, but we are confident that we will uh, find the right partners to really give us the proper guidance and to keep us um, out of that, you know, in my putting on my general counsel and, and head of PR and communications hat to keep <laughs> us out of that negative press space. Thank you so much for this great conversation, for the leap of faith that you're showing, for the positive note that you're having. It's about getting started. It's about, yes, get the ducks in a row, but it's doable, we can get there. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing the insights of how you experienced the journey so far. I think it's hugely valuable for anybody listening. So greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much.